So I'm pleased to introduce next is Laura Smith, who's the Managing Director and Founder of Core Consultants, to address the review and outlook for minor metals for this year. Laura is Core Consulting's Managing Director, as I said, and she began her career as an analyst for a Cape Town asset management firm. And she gained experience there analyzing South African platinum, gold, oil, and soft commodity sectors. She also worked for the Steinmetz Group, where she worked on evaluating potential mining acquisitions throughout Africa and the Baltic region. And since then, she's taken on a number of projects in her own independent capacity, including studies in the coke, ferroalloys, manganese, and lithium markets. Laura read for her degrees from the University of Cape Town, and it's my pleasure to welcome her now to speak to you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would just like to thank the mining in Darba for once again coordinating an outstanding event and for affording core consultants the opportunity to address you at this forum. Um, for those of you who are unacquainted with core consultants, we are a focused mining consultancy offering bespoke research and analysis and market outlooks for a number of commodities, including bulk, base, and minor metals. Nope, it's still not working. Um, and in addition, last year we launched a number of subscription reports, which we aim to continue in 2012. Okay, it's happening. All right. In keeping with the same structure as last year, I have chosen three minor metals which we believe are necessary for the continuation of our modern way of life, yet suffer the potential supply constraints. Each of these metals have been recognized by both the EU and the US um, as critical metals, and we will provide a high-level overview of the specific market dynamics affecting cobalt, tantalum, and rare earth markets. So let's just kick off with the cobalt market. Over 50% of cobalt reserves are contained in the DRC, yet in 2011 it remained the case that less than 5% of cobalt was refined in this region. Most of it is going east to China for refinement, and in fact, China represents the largest exporter of cobalt to the United States. With respect to its applications, cobalt has numerous uses, including super alloys and catalysts, but its growth in the battery applications has outpaced all other end uses and now accounts for 27% of overall consumption compared to only 11% in 2002. If we have a look at the mobile um, phones with respect to batteries, 3.6 grams of cobalt is used in just about every single cellular phone. And since 2005, the number of mobile phone subscribers has increased from 2 billion to 5.8 billion in 2011. If we consider that the average global penetration rate of cellular users was 85% in 2011, then we believe that there is still substantial gains to be had in Africa and Asia where the penetration rates are much lower. In Africa, the penetration rates are only 42% and in Asia, they are still hovering around 75%. Incidentally, at this time last year when I stood up here, these figures looked like 34% for Africa and around 68% for Asia. So we can see the startling growth in only a year in this market. Similarly, for laptops and tablets, I see a lot of you with your iPads. Growth since 2009 has increased 35% and production is expected to double over the next five years, requiring an estimated 11,000 tons of cobalt. The most exciting development in the battery market, however, remains that of electric vehicles. A good approximation to use, we believe, is four kilograms for a hybrid electric vehicle and six kilograms for an electric vehicle battery. Based on announced plans by leading automotive manufacturers, we believe that we should see about 12 to 13 million hybrid and electric vehicles on our roads by 2020. This will necessitate as much as 20 to 30,000 tons of cobalt. Additionally, China is expected to produce an estimated 80 million electric bicycles by 2015, and if lithium battery technology is adopted for these, this would place further upward pressure on cobalt. 
The use of cobalt in super alloys remains an, a major demand industry. With respect to future requirements, in December last year, Boeing revealed their largest commercial deal in history, $19 billion, when Southwest Airlines placed an order for 208 single-aisle aircrafts. In addition, Boeing forecasts a demand of 33,500 new aircrafts over the next 20 years, while Airbus has speculated that the U.S. will require almost 6,000 new passenger aircrafts by 2030, and Asia will need 8,500 new aircrafts over the same period. Turning our attention to supply, however, there are a number of new projects in the pipeline, though by and large these projects are contained in the DRC a region where geopolitics has been and could become again tumultuous. Moreover, transport logistics in Africa as a whole is in need of a continental overhaul and is extremely problematic, and this could bring supply disruption. In the middle of last year, I presented our analysis of the DRC's logistical challenges at the Cobalt Institute's annual convention, and I'm just going to show this slide, which shows that given the announced copper, cobalt, and zinc projects, all of which compete for the same logistical infrastructure, we expect a future mine rate of 550,000 tons by 2016. Then assuming that all projects come to fruition and no upgrade to the current infrastructure, this would result in over 500 trucks queuing at the border en route from Kowesi by 2016 and over 700 trucks thereafter. In addition to the transport constraints, we mentioned that last year at this forum that companies will place increased emphasis on diversifying their production away from the DRC. To some extent, this has been realized. Japan and the EU have passed strategy aimed at securing strategic metals through partnerships, trade agreements, and acquisitions. The U.S., through its restart program, has facilitated diversification through creating a national stockpile and financing domestic production projects. There is the looming threat that as China accounts for the lion's share of cobalt refinement and indeed leads the supply of cobalt imports to the United States, that China could potentially restrict exports of cobalt, as they have done with numerous other commodities, including rare earths, which we will touch on later, and tungsten. This could lead to greater price volatility and increased risk of supply disruption. Overall, we are bullish on the sector as we see, foresee continued strong demand for cobalt driven by increased penetration rates of cellular phones in developing countries as well as other portable devices, lithium batteries in electric vehicles and robust demand from the super alloy industry. Meanwhile, the sector has the potential to be plagued by supply disruptions, first from poor logistics and infrastructure and then the looming threat that China could apply an export quota. If we now look at the tantalum market, the tantalum, differs, uh, the tantalum market differs from the cobalt market somewhat in that tantalum markets uh, and tantalum is more widely dispersed across the globe. Only 10% of proven reserves are actually found in Africa, and only 2% is located in Central Africa. That being said, it has been estimated that since 2009, over 50% of the world tantalum supply originated from Africa, and a significant proportion of that is said to come from artisanal mining in the DRC. So it's probably um, more sensible to talk about the most likely resource base, recognizing that artisanal miners and illegal miners typically do not prove up their reserve base. And if we consider the most likely resource base, then Africa would account more for about 16% of, um, of global resources and Central Africa 9%. With respect to end uses, as with a number of minor metals, new technologies leading to the miniaturization of electric devices, which have become smaller, lighter, and with more processing power, have resulted in increased usage of tantalum. In particular, tantalum-based capacitors are on the rise as they are used in automotive electronics, mobile phones, personal computers, and wireless devices. Capacitors now account for 60% of tantalum consumption, compared to only 51% in 2004. Yet while tantalum consumption has increased by around 3.5 million pounds um, since 2004, growth in tantalum demand has been relatively lackluster over the past 15 years or so when we compare it to metals of the electronic sectors. 
but the cobalt part of our presentation showed the potential uh, for these devices and automotives, which could, in our opinion, lead to threefold growth of tantalum con consumption from 2007 levels. On the supply side, production was traditionally supplemented by secondary sources, including the U.S. Defense Logistics Agency stockpile sales, recycling, long-term contracts, and preemptive buying and tin slag. These sources accounted for around 45% in 2007. However, since 2007, there have been no DLA sales of tantalum. Additionally, recycling is becoming more difficult due to higher recovery costs and the miniaturization of electronic parts, which use um, a lot less tantalum metal. And furthermore, the retrieval of tantalum from tin slag is also declining. Um, our previous speaker, Kevin, um, put up forecasts for tin um, supply, and I noticed that he's only projecting 0.8% of increased supply in 2012 and 0.2% for the next five years. So it is then evident that tin slag um, sources is, is declining for tantalum. And in 2010, only 36% of tantalum arose from these sources. Moreover, tantalum is traditionally sold under long-term contracts as opposed to the spot market, so companies have always engaged in preemptive buying. During the tech boom, tantalum inventories were stored up by companies based on projection of their demand for their products, and then the tech bubble ensured that these stockpiles were prolonged even further. Similarly, in 2008, the economic recession and ensuring slowdown in consumer demand ensured that tantalum consumers were long on supply. We conjecture that the reason the price is not yet reflective of a deficit market is due to these stockpiles, which we estimate will be depleted over the next 12 months or so as consumer demand improves. In terms of primary sources, in December 2008, Talisson Minerals, which is now called Global Advanced Minerals, placed their two Australian mines on care and maintenance, Greenbushes green and Wadgina. Together, these mines accounted for 2.4 million pounds of tantalum pentoxide, or 38% of global tantalum supply. In January last year, operations at Wajina Mine recommenced, but the company indicated that they would only produce around 700,000 pounds. In reality, we understand that they are producing more cl closer to half a million pounds. In addition to the global financial crisis, the other reason cited for halting productions in, in um, Australia was due to the influx of low-priced coltan mining coming from the DRC's illegal and artisanal miners. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Act introduced in July 2010 legislates that companies which consume minerals from conflict zones, in particular tantalum, tin, tungsten and gold from the DRC, have to now show provenance of these minerals and demonstrate that they were not conflict or blood minerals. This could facilitate the issue of lower price imports of coltan. However, to date, the implementation of this act has been delayed a number of times, most recently December 2011. Under the act, companies are expected to be granted a grace period of 12 months to either demonstrate provenance or find alternative supply sources. This means that full implementation of this legislation will most likely not come into effect before the end of 2013, and subsequently cheaper coltan from the DRC and Rwanda may continue to fill the supply gap and stabilize prices. A consideration of the current and future tantalum projects enables us to draw conclusions on the outlook for supply, demand, and future price direction of the strategic metal. Should you wish to obtain a copy of those projects which we have included in our presentation, then you're welcome to email us and we'll provide them. The 2008-2009 recession caused a reduction in demand for electronics, which had a knock-on effect on tantalum. However, if we assume a conservative steady growth rate of 4% in the coming years, then the market will be perfectly balanced. Growth above 4% will result in a supply shortage as early as 2014. Consequently, we believe that prices should ultimately move to reflect this deficit. Finally, we consider the rare earth market. Rare earths have become a political and legislative issue since China decided to reduce their export quota by 40% in 2010. In December, China opted to keep the quota at similar levels to the second half of 2011, a signal to the market that they wished to continue their stranglehold on the market while ensuring stable prices. Of the 16 rare earth elements, five of them, including dysprosium, terbium, europium, neodymium, and yttrium, face a looming shortage. 
A deficit of these materials would impact a number of key industries, including solar panels, fluorescent bulbs, electric car batteries, and wind turbines. Recently, core consultants undertook a study quantifying the requirements of these elements in each of these industries, from which we drew the following conclusions. Using our predictions for electric vehicles shown earlier, we expect that by 2015, nearly 3,000 tons of neodymium oxide and dysprosium oxide will be needed. Again, by 2015, almost 12,000 tons of neodymium will be needed for wind power, as the sector is expected to grow from the current 33,000 megawatts to three, sorry, 133,000 megawatts to 381,000 megawatts, owing to increased supply, uh, increased capacity from China. The photovoltaic market is expected to increase by 14,500 megawatts over the next three years, which will place increased pr pressure on demand for yttrium, whilst the fluorescent market is expected to require 2,500 tons of rare earth oxide by 2015. So a consideration again of current and announced rare earth projects, taking into account the contained rare earth metals and whether those projects are likely to come on stream or whether the geology is even mineable or extractable. If we consider all the rare earths, then we project a surplus market by 2014. However, if we consider only those aforementioned critical rare earths, those five which we discussed earlier, then even our most optimistic projections leads us to the conclusion that the market will be in deficit by some 20,000 tons as early as 2015. Finally, just to end off with a quick summary, cobalt is finding increased use in the battery sector, though supply logistics from the DRC are challenging. Additionally, there is the risk that China could cap cobalt exports. In the tantalum market, Australian suppliers have reduced their production and the impending Dodd-Frank law threatens to curb the supply of blood coltan. Meanwhile, secondary sources have declined as the DLA stopped selling their, uh, their stockpile cells in 2007 and the recycling is becoming increasingly inefficient and expensive. Consequently, the establishment of new tantalum sources outside the DRC we believe is imperative. Finally, in the rare earth market, the Chinese export quota has reduced the availability of rare earths. Additionally, if we take into account all the projects, even our most optimistic view suggests a shortage of 20,000 tons of critical rare earth metals by 2015. Based on our analysis, we do agree that these metals should be considered critical, and we believe that these, risks, and these metals run the risks of being in critical short supply in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laurie, we do have some time for questions. If anyone would like to ask a question from the floor, uh, please do so. Laurie, perhaps you could just, uh, your projections for wind power growth and electric vehicles, how optimistic is that? Is that a baseline scenario? Um, I do believe it's a baseline scenario. If you look at, um, and that's just China, if you actually look at what Germany is putting out as a plan, um, they're looking at an increased growth in some 20 percent. Um, China's tripling growth um, by 2015, and they're actively looking. So yes, that, that is a base projection. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the floor? All right, you've got off lightly as well. I thank did. you very thank much. Thank you very much. much.